Let's jump into the word. Um, you ever come across a passage of scripture that makes you just scratch your head a little bit? <laughs> and you're like, I don't, I don't really know, know what this is. It's obviously there for a reason. Uh, you may have even read it before, but for some reason it just jumps out to you and then you can't quite figure it out. So I was reading a week or so ago and I came across this passage in 2 Kings chapter 4. Um, and do you guys, some of you guys will remember we did a message on the Shunammite woman from 2 Kings 4 back in the beginning of the year. It was part of our forward theme. We called it two steps forward, one step back. And we talked about how slow progress is still progress. But the verses right after that story of the Shunammite woman where her, she, was, uh, she wasn't able to have kids and then um, there was a miracle that took place. She had a child and then the child died, her son died, and then uh, she was, he was raised back to life. Right after that is where we pick up this story. It's just four verses, and I was reading it, and I was just like, I don't know. So let me read it. 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning in verse 38. And it says, Elisha returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in that region. And while the company of the prophets was meeting with him, he said to his servant, Put on the large pot and cook some stew for these prophets. And one of them went out into the fields to gather some herbs and found a wild vine and picked as many of its gourds as his garment could hold. And when he returned, he cut them up into the pot of stew, though no one knew what they were. And the stew was poured out for the men, but as they began to eat it, they cried out, Man of God, there's death in the pot. And they could not eat it. And Elisha said, Get some flour. And he put it in the pot and said, Serve it to the people to eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. And to me, this is a weird story. Right? The dude... This dude, one of the students one of, the, of, of Elisha, the school of the prophets, he goes out, he's, Elisha says, make some stew. He goes out to pick some herbs, and he inadvertently, not inadvertently, he picks up these poisonous gourds. He obviously didn't know they were poisoned. He chops them up, throws them in the stew. It poisons there, like, we can't, we can't eat this, it's poison. Elisha then says, hey, just bring some flour, so throw some flour into it. And whatever he throws in, the stew neutralizes whatever poison that there was in there, so it was good to eat. And then that's it. Four verses about poison stew, and then it moves on, never mentioned again. I mean, how many of you have ever, how many of you have ever had to do this when you cook? Right, you're cooking something up, you're following the recipe, and then you taste it, and you're like, I don't know, something's a little, there's death in the pot. I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> Don't look at your wife, nobody. Yeah. You're like, I don't know what this is. So you end up by having to add some ingredients to try to fix it. Anybody having to do that? A couple, of we- a couple of months ago, I made some chili and it was just too spicy. I know spicy is relative. Uh, I'm, I like spicy, what I think is spicy, but most people think I'm a wimp. And uh, it was just too hot for my family. So I messaged our resident culinary expert, Pastor David, I could Google, but it's just more fun to message him. And I was like, this is too spicy. What do I do? And he said, just add some sugar to it, which is something I'm actually really good at. I feel like <laughs> I kind of feel like a pro at adding sugar to things. My coffee is always full of sugar. One time my mom was home and I just kept putting, she was like, are you putting that much sugar in your coffee? And I was like, you do you. I don't do me. <laughs> I don't eat peanut butter and jelly. I eat peanut butter and sugar. Anybody? It's just how I grew up. Just try it before you look. I see people snarling. Just make your peanut, put a little sugar on it, you'll like it. Sometimes I add sugar to things that already have sugar, like Frosted Flakes. Anybody add sugar to your Frosted You do that? Yeah. Hey. <clears throat> Anyone else do weird things like that? All right, well, needless to say, I ruined the chili, and uh, I put it in a to-go thing and brought it to Pastor David, and his, his family ate it. I don't know. Anyway, all right, let's go back, uh, back to the passage. I just kept reading this passage over and over again, trying to understand what I was reading. And then I began to do some word studies, which I like to do. And the first word that I looked up was in verse 38, and it's the word Gilgal. Gilgal means wheel or rolling. And when I read that, it reminded me of something, and I began to just research it, and it took me back to Joshua chapter 5. We're going to spend some time in Joshua 5, and then we'll fast forward back to Kings. The first time we read about Gilgal is with Joshua and the Israelites, and they are about to cross, uh, they're about to go into their promised land. So before we read the passage, let's recap what's happening in the book of Joshua. So Moses is dead. That happens in Joshua chapter 1 there. And, and Joshua is now taking over as the leader of the Israelites. And God says, I'm about to take you into the promised land. 
So in Joshua chapter 2, Joshua sends in spies into the land to check it all out. And that's where the spies almost get caught. But Rahab, the prostitute, rescues them. And then in Joshua chapter 3, which we spent some time talking about in our forward series, talking about crossing over, uh, God commands the children of Israel to follow the Ark of the Covenant. And then... um, which led us to Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. And we spent some time talking about this verse, Joshua 3, 5, where he says, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. So what does consecrate mean? This is a little review if you were here a couple of months ago. We already talked about this. Consecrate means to set apart. It means to consecrate, sanctify, to prepare, to dedicate, to be hallowed, be holy, be sanctified, be separate. See, we all love the God is about to do amazing things among you part. All right, we love that you're about to go into the promised land part. But Joshua says, before you do anything else, prepare yourself, dedicate yourself, sanctify and set yourself apart. Consecrate yourself. Right, this isn't a consecrate yourself to get God to do, uh, do for you what you want him to do. God, I wish I had this or that, so I'll consecrate myself to you and you will do it for me. Listen, we have to distance ourselves from consumer Christianity. I mean, I said last week, God is not a genie in a bottle, right? Our kids, uh, you know, I'm older. I feel like I spoil the, my, the, the babies more than I did my uh, older kids. We're on a monster truck kick right now, Hot Wheels monster trucks. Man, it just every time I walk by, I just can't help it. I just buy one for them, and they love it. And there's a show, there's a bunch of videos on YouTube you can watch. If you're interested in watching three hours of Hot Wheels Monster Truck Races, just put it on and let it go, and it'll change your life. I, I, I just get all excited, like, oh, he didn't win, but I've already seen it 12 times. How do I know? Anyway, so um, talking about just trying to consecrate ourselves so that the Lord will do something for us. We've just gotten it. Now the boys, we've spoiled them, and they think every time we go to the store, they're going to get one. And uh, they were making some bad choices the other day. And so Katie came up. She went into teacher mode, and she made this seven-day chart. So they have to get smiley faces of behavior for seven days, and then they can get one. And so the other day, Bennett was kind of giving us some, uh, you know, giving us some trouble trying to go to bed and just the whole routine, doesn't want to go to sleep and things like that. If you've got three-year-olds, you know what that's like. And she reminded him of the smiley face thing. So he consecrated himself, right? He's like, oh, okay. So he's doing, they're do, he's following the rules, but it's in order to get something. That's not what this consecration is talking about. This is a, I'm going all in, I'm giving you everything that I have. So consecrating ourselves, what it does is it puts us in alignment with the plan that God has already established for our lives. When we consecrate ourselves, we're setting our lives, our desires, our wills aside, and we're submitting it to the will of the Father. All right, so the end of Joshua 3, into chapter 4, the Israelites, are, they cross over the Jordan River. The river, the Bible says, was at flood stage. And when the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant stepped into the river, the river basically stood up in a heap on one side, and then and, and the water just flowed down. And so you've got this heap of water right here. The, the priests are standing there with the Ark of the Covenant, and... Hundreds of thousands of Israelites just walk across on dry land. They walk a mile all the way across. So God has, again, in the lives of the Israelites, done the impossible. He's performed great miracles on their behalf, which leads us to, in chapter 5, the first mention of the word Gilgal. And that's where we will pick up, pick up the story. Uh, Joshua chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Now, when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over, their hearts melted in fear and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. Look, God is on the side of the Israelites. Their enemies are terrified. They no longer even want to fight them. Joshua and the Israelites are now looking at their promised land. They can see Jericho which is the first city that they captured. They can hear the sounds of the city. They can smell the aroma of all of the foods being cooked. Remember, they've been eating manna for 40 years. They've consecrated themselves. They've set themselves apart. They've prepared themselves. And now their destiny is right there in front of them. But there's just one more thing that they have to do. Verse 2. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Ha'aralath. Now, this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, 
All the men of military age died in the wilderness on their way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the wilderness for 40 years until all the men who were military age uh, when they left Egypt had died since they had not obeyed the Lord. You remember that story? They were complaining and, and they sent spies in. Joshua and Caleb were like, we can take this land. But 10 of the spies, their voice outweighed the two spies that were on God's side. And basically God's like, fine, okay. You say you're going to die in the desert, you're going to die in the desert. And every one of military age died. And so that's what's happening. And so for the Lord had sworn to them they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised their ancestors to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. And so he raised up their sons in their place. And these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still, circum, um, they were still cir- uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. And then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you, so that, the place, so that that place has been called Gilgal to this day. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, when camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. And the day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. I probably could have stopped a couple of verses ahead of that, but that's just such a great passage. I wonder how many of us are staring at our destiny, right? We're so close that we can see how beautiful it is. We can hear the sounds of the music being played and the hustle and bustle of the city. We can smell the aromas. We've spent our time in the wilderness and now we've consecrated ourselves. We've set ourselves apart. We've prepared ourselves. We've won some battles. God has done some miracles. We've crossed some rivers, but one thing remains. We can't go in until we cut away that which is unnecessary. In order for us to accomplish all that God is calling us to, there has to be a cutting away. There has to be a spiritual circumcision. See, Gilgal is a place of complete surrender and complete trust. We have to trust God with the knife. Gilgal is a place of vulnerability because there's no place more vulnerable than the table of circumcision. Right? We, often have, we often live secret lives. We hide those things that need to be cut away while God is saying to you, I need you to be honest. I need you to stop hiding. But this is the same thing that Adam and Eve did in the Garden, uh, Garden of Eden. Let's read it really quick in Genesis chapter 3. They were instructed in the garden to only eat of one tree, but they did it. They ate of, the, of another tree that they weren't supposed to eat from. And in verse 8 it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from him, or they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman that you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And then the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. It's the blame game, right? He blames her, she blames the devil. Now here we are, thousands of years later, still responding the same way. We hide our sin, not only from others, but from God. When God is the only one who can bring complete forgiveness and healing. But we have to be willing to open up our lives and let Him see everything. Write this down if you're taking notes, take a picture of it. God can't heal what we're unwilling to reveal. He can't heal what we are unwilling to reveal. See, some of us are wondering why we can't get free from this sin or that sin. right? Until we're ready to come out from hiding and reveal all that we are, we will never receive our complete freedom. Will it be easy? Absolutely not. Gilgal is a place of pain. Circumcision is painful. The cutting away process is painful. But we want to hide. You think God didn't know where they were when he said, where are you? And he's walking in the garden. God knows everything. He wanted Adam to reveal himself. Adam and Eve were hiding. Where are you? Like he, did. he was forcing Adam 
to come out of hiding and show who he was and what he had done. Gilgal is not only a place of pain, but here's the good news. It's a place of healing. It's a place of healing. Joshua 5 eight, And it says, After the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. See, a lot of us are trying so hard to get to the next level. But God says you can't move until the next, to the next level until you're willing to be circumcised and go through the healing process. You can't move into the promised land until you complete this progression. Now watch verse 9. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So that place was called Gilgal to this day. See, some of us are carrying shame from our past. We carry shame from our sin. We carry shame from our failures. And because of that, like Adam and Eve, we hide. We hide from others. We hide from God. We put on our masks and we carry on with life. And all the while, underneath our mask, we're hurting and broken and full of shame and humiliation. But the only way that I can control the shame is to hide the real me. But ironically, the only way I can get rid of the shame is to reveal the real me. Instead, we develop these ungodly beliefs about ourselves and about God. And we begin to believe the lie from Satan that if they knew the real me, they would reject me. See, that's why authenticity is our first core value as a church. We want to be a place where people can take off their masks, a place where people can be themselves, a place where it's okay to not be okay. Why? Because we know from experience that healing comes in the vulnerability. Healing comes when we stop hiding. Healing comes when we take down our masks and get real with God. It's in that place of complete vulnerability that God takes the knife and begins to cut away all that's unnecessary. Sin and shame and failure and rejection and insecurity and inadequacy, inferiority and comparison and jealousy. God wants to remove all of the shame. God wants to do something significantly in our lives to remove those barriers that keep us from moving forward. Gilgal is also a place of new beginnings. See, Gilgal is the launching pad into our destiny. Gilgal literally means wheel, which is an indicator of movement. See, the Israelites camped there. They didn't take up residence there. And that's part of the process. We come to this cutting away moment, and the fear is I'm going to live in this moment forever. But it's just a passing through. You're just camping there long enough to do the surgery and heal, and then you move into the next step. I mean, I can relate to that. I just had surgery 10, I don't know, two and a half weeks ago, and, and I was scared. I really was. It's been a long time since I've been under. The last time was when I got my wisdom teeth, I think, but before the, any, the major, any kind of major surgery I had, I had my appendix, they were about to burst, they took that out, but that was like a long time ago. And I, you know, I'm a chicken. I was afraid. Right, your mind plays tricks on you, you think, oh, it's supposed to be outpatient surgery, I'm maybe in the hospital for a week. You know, and it's just, it's, but it, the, the surgery process was quick and easy, and then you begin the healing process, and then you move on into the rest of your life. But fear says, if you go to this, if you unveil yourself, if you show God everything, if he begins to cut things away, it's going to be painful. Yes, it is. But it's not going to stay painful because that's where the healing comes. You're carrying a lot more pain trying to make it on your own than we would if we just unveiled everything and said, God, here I am, cut away whatever you need to cut away. It's a place that we're supposed to just pass through. We camp, we get surgery. We get healed. We move into our promised land and to our destiny. All right, let's fast forward back to 2 Kings. That was a weird oxymoron. Fast forward back. I don't know. Let's go back. Go back to 2 Kings. Fast forward to 2 Kings. Elisha returned to Gilgal. And there was a famine in that region. While the company of the prophets was meeting with them, he said to his servant, put on a large pot and cook some stew for these prophets. One of them went out into the fields to gather herbs and found a wild vine and picked as many of its gourds as his garment could hold. And when he returned, he cut them up into the stew, though no one knew what they were. And the stew was poured out for the men, but as they began to eat it, they cried out, Man of God, there's death in the pot. They could not eat it. And Elisha said, Get some flour. He put it in the pot and said, Serve it to the people to eat. And then there was nothing harmful in the pot. 
Gilgal is supposed to be a place of cutting away. It's supposed to be a place of healing. It's supposed to be a place of movement. It's supposed to be a place of new beginnings. But in 2 Kings, Gilgal looks completely different. Instead of movement, there's stagnation. Instead of abundance, there's famine. Instead of looking at and being in the land flowing with milk and honey, there's wild and poisonous gourds. Instead of cutting away, they're adding things too. See, one of the students of the prophet is making the stew. He decided to add some ingredients, which apparently look good. Why else would he have put them in there? But they were poisonous. I wonder how many of us are adding ingredients that look good, but we're actually destroying our destiny. How many of us are on the cusp of our promise, but we're adding things that are poisoning our purpose? And Elisha said, get some flour. He put it into the pot and said, serve it to the people. Look, to me, this is a weird thing to ask for. But as I began to study, I learned that flour is a representation of the pure word of God. See, we have to come back to a place that God's word is enough. A place where we do and say only what his word says. A place where we stop adding poisonous ingredients when we're supposed to be cutting away all the things that are keeping us from moving forward. And then it says in the, in the back part of the verse, and there was nothing harmful in the pot. Now look, this is a little weird, and I can't say that I understand all the Hebrew implications here. But the word harmful, it means to speak, to declare, converse, command, promise, warn, threaten, sing. When Elisha added flour, which is a representation of the pure word of God, it neutralized the poisonous ingredients, which literally means the words we speak, the stew. He, the words we speak, we're putting harmful things. See, when we come to Gilgal, God wants to cut away all the things that are keeping us from our destiny. He wants to roll away our sin and shame and regret. But instead, uh, instead of uh, opening ourselves up, instead of becoming vulnerable, instead of becoming naked in front of God, we hide and we can begin to poison our future with the words that we're speaking. See, I believe God is calling us back to a Gilgal moment. Some of you are staring at your destiny and you're waiting and you're wondering when you can go in. But in order for us to move into the next season, we have to be willing to open up completely. We have to stop hiding. We have to be willing to be vulnerable. We have to allow God to begin to cut away everything that's not of him. And we have to stop poisoning our future with the words that we speak. Now is the time to neutralize the poisonous words we've spoken by using the flower, the pure word of God. We've talked about this hit and miss over the last number of months, going back to when we did an extended series on ungodly beliefs. But how many of us are creating strongholds in our minds by the words that we speak? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Negative faith comes from hearing negative things. God kind of faith comes from hearing the word of God. And so when, when and, and Jesus said what? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever we're putting in, garbage in, garbage out. Whatever, if you're putting garbage in, that's what's going to come out. But in the story, Elisha neutralizes the poisonous words with the word of God. He neutralizes the poison. And so for us, I think we have to do an inventory of the things that we're saying about ourselves, about our destiny. Even in the beginning, when, when I was talking and I started to say three and a half years into this mess, look, that's, maybe that's no big deal to you, but that, that used to be how I talked all the time and I believed it. I've, I've had to correct my own language, the way that I speak over this church, the way that I speak over my family. Those of you that have been here for the journey, you've probably seen some, some sort of, I hope you've seen transformation, but even you'll remember in the beginning, just constant self-deprecation, not good enough, not going to make it. People are like, dude, stop putting yourself down. Like I, yeah. Every service you leave, like, oh God, that's the worst sermon I ever preached. People message you, man, I just received such word of you know, healing. I've received all this stuff. And like, oh, you, then you feel terrible for like a week trying to get ready for the next sermon. And it's just, just speaking death into your pot of stew. And what we should be doing is declaring the word of God. What is it that God is saying? We spent two weeks talking about Pentecost. 
And a recurring theme every time I talk about that is the disconnect between the moving of God that we see in the New Testament and what we see uh, in, in presented in our, in our lives today. What is the disconnect? Maybe it's the lack of circumcision. So we consecrate ourselves and we surrender and we go through the, the, the motions and we, we use the language of all of this stuff. But maybe God, see, that was the first step in Joshua 3. He said, consecrate yourselves. I'm about to do amazing things among you. And he did amazing things. He split the Jordan River and they walked across on dry land. And then God says, one more thing before you go in, you've got to cut this away. Are there things that you and I need to cut away to go into our destiny? As everyday church, as we sit here on the cusp of what's next, one way or the other, something is about to happen. We're either going to be, this place is either going to shut down, we're going to find somewhere else, or God's going to provide, and we're going to have this place. I don't, I don't know what God's got to do with a miracle, but as we stand here waiting on Him, are we looking at our destiny? Are we looking at where He wants to take us? And He's saying, you can't move there until you cut away that which is unnecessary. Are we struggling with sin in our lives and struggling with things that we just can't get over? And he said, you can't move to the next level until you cut away that which is necessary. Go back to Gilgal. Cut it away so that I can remove the shame. See, in order to move into the next season, we have to be willing to open up completely. We have to stop hiding. We have to become vulnerable. Anytime we find ourselves in a situation where something needs to cut away, we're at Gilgal. And sometimes it's hard. You know, the people in the room right now that have, they're, they're, they're have you know, they're, they're, there's a season changing. You know, people have been doing one thing for a while, and there's a cutting away that's taking place. There mul- As I look around the room, there's multiple people in the room that that's happening to. There's a cutting away, and sometimes it's painful. Sometimes that means a leaving something that you're really attached to. But the only way to step into your destiny, the only way to step into what God has called you to, you have to go through the cutting away process. And then God brings the healing. And out of the healing flows purpose and your promised land. Anytime we find ourselves in that situation, we are at Gilgal. And how we respond in that moment will determine what's next. You can camp at Gilgal forever if you want. But we'll never move into our destiny until we're willing to go through the process of cutting away and healing. Adrian, you can come play. What do you need to cut away today? Or what do you need to allow God to cut away? It may be painful, but the end result will be freedom and healing and purpose. I mean, isn't what Pastor David said during the offering? On the front end, it's a little bit tough, but on the back end, what you get is, is the freedom. Are you poisoning your future with your words? Are you poisoning your family with your words? Are you poisoning your marriage with your words? You know, again, we're trying to be intentional in our own house. And some of you think this is dumb, but even even in the way we correct our kids, we try to be very careful with the language that we're using. You know, as I've learned, I know a lot more than I did the first time around about ungodly beliefs. And I've seen firsthand how, how parental, um, you know, I've seen it in people where parental word curses have been spoken and then children have to carry that on. People that are just broken on the inside because of things that their parents said to them. So we're trying to be very intentional about just even the way we discipline our kids. You know, we, we say, again, this may sound kind of stupid. This is how, and, and it's a correction of language. So sometimes I don't get it right. You know, when they come back from somewhere where it wasn't their normal routine, we would say, hey, were you a good boy? Well, we don't say that anymore. 
We say, did you make good decisions? When you leave, when they leave and they're going to Mimi's house, we say, hey, make good decisions while you're gone. I, I don't want to speak, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, every time they make a, make a mistake. Look, I know that we're all born sinners. We're born bad, essentially, right? Until God brings redemption to us. But I'm, I'm a picture of the Father to my kids. Amen. So I want to speak life over them and say, hey, you need to make better decisions, not you were bad. I don't want them growing up thinking I'm just bad. I just... After I spank them, both of them, we sit them down and I say, and I make them say it back. I say, Daddy loves me. Daddy loves me. Mommy loves me. Mommy loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I'm a good boy. I'm a good boy. And then I make them say, I love Daddy. I love Mommy. I love Jesus. If they've done something to each other, I make them say, I love Emmett. I love Bennett. I'm a good boy. And maybe that's, again, I don't want to poison my children's future by speaking on them that you're just bad. So we try to correct the, that kind of language. But how many of us are doing that? How many of us are putting poison in the pot of stew? We're adding ingredients when we're supposed to be cutting things away. We're adding sugar to try to fix it instead of adding the Word of God. We're adding things that make us feel good when God is calling us to add things that are that may be difficult. <laughs> What is it in your life that you need to allow God to cut away? He can't cut it away until you reveal it. He can't cut it away until you reveal it. If you're unwilling to show it to him, then what's he going to do? I told the story before. and I wish that my life would have been perfect from that moment forward, but I've, I've made plenty of mistakes since then. But I remember a moment I was having devotions at home by myself. I don't think um, Ben and Emmett were born yet. Katie was uh, teaching. She was at work. <clears throat> and I was doing devotions, and I came across a scripture. I don't even remember what the verse was. And it was just about, it was just a similar theme of this, about not hiding and I began to pray and spend some time in prayer. And I was just saying, God, I want to be an open book before you. I want to open up all the areas of my life. And I remember feeling prompted by the Holy Spirit and to open up all the closets and turn all the lights on, every door in the house. And I did. I went through, I opened every closet, I turned on every light in the house, I opened up the garage doors, the garage closets. Everything in the house was open. And I was just declaring over my life prophetically that that was going to be my life anymore from, from, then, from then on. That I wanted to be an open book so that at any moment you could pick up my phone and look at the history and go, oh, he's, he's doing what he's supposed to do. Not having to hide things away in a closet. Like Lewis talked about a few weeks ago. Not having to clear your history on your computer or on your phone. Not having to delete text messages where you said something you shouldn't have said. Not having to, whatever, fill in the blank. I'm not saying you'd be an open book to everybody. There are people in this room right now that I would trust telling them my deepest, darkest secrets, but not everybody. But the one person you can't hide from is the Lord. And He can't roll away the shame until you open up and reveal yourself to Him and let Him cut whatever needs to be cut away. Away. Amen. Amen. Let's go back to Gilgal. Let's cut away. Let Him roll the shame away. And then let's move into our destiny. Let's pray. God, thank you. On behalf of Pastor Randy and the entire staff at Everyday Church, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. For more information on the church, please visit us at everydaychurch.xyz.